Dr. Decker. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a real leader. And I think um, the word beacon is an appropriate one to describe uh, what uh, Nancy Levine has done for our field throughout her career, whether that has been uh, in an agency setting, uh, leading the, the Colson task force that I think is a, a lesser known and underappreciated a uh, bit of work uh, than it than it deserves. Uh, also, her her work leading uh, the Urban Institute uh, ha has been exemplary. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think ties the various parts of of her work together is the desire to produce change. It, it's one thing to produce a study and put it up on the shelf and, and let it gather dust or, or whatever they do on, on those shelves. It's quite another though, to write in a way, to do research in a way, uh, to, to find policy conclusions that can produce the kinds of changes uh, that many of us believe can be done and should be done. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we have a continued strong leadership in the National Institute of Justice, which is so important, uh, not only in a minor way to the, to the academics out there, but to the agencies and to the people who can do research and speak to agencies as well. Uh, with great pleasure, uh, I wanna welcome uh, Dr. Nancy Levine. Uh, we've got about 45 minutes set aside and. I, I, like others, I'm sure, are anxious to hear what she has to say. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Scott. Can you hear me? I always like to check before I start rambling. Um, thank you. That was probably the best introduction I've received during my tenure at NIJ. Uh, I get very embarrassed when I hear people read that long bio. <laughs> And um, you focused on um, what I'm most proud of in my career. So I really appreciate that. Looks like Tim had his hand up. Tim, did you want to say a few words? Or was that an accident? Well, anyway, an great accident. to see you. I'm so sorry. Oh. It was an accident. I'm it's so quite sorry. all right. It's quite all right. Um, good to not see you. <laughs> um, before we begin, I have to say, while I've been waiting to join this uh, conversation, I've been suffering from some serious flag envy. I mean, my flag is so small, and you CNA staff have these big flags, and I'm kind of like, what's wrong with this picture? Aren't I the political appointee? Why is my flag so puny? I'm really, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I have a, an inferiority com complex. I'm, I'm going to try to set it aside for now and focus on the content, but, you know, if I get a little derailed, it's just because of the flags. Uh, but in all seriousness, and I can be a little playful, I think, with this group and this audience, because I love CNA and JRI and have long been um, a friend and a collaborator, both formally and informally, with so many of you. And um, so much of what you do is aligned with what I believe and what I've been doing in my professional life for um more years than I care to uh, mention, I will say, Scott, like hats off for you for still like tallying up the years, 45, huh? <laughs> I stopped counting a while ago. I'm not putting that on my CV, um, but it, you know, it has been a minute or two. And um, I have like over the years had many touch points with CNA and I'm so impressed with the work that CNA has done and of course, now as director of NIJ to um, see those partnerships that NIJ and CNA have uh, forged over the years uh, has been really heartwarming and inspirational. And because of my long knowledge of and love for CNA, I've also been observing CNA and JRI's trajectory over time and how you've shifted your mission, how you've evolved and your focus in ways that really resonate with the needs of the field. Um, and I think one prime example of that 
is uh, the establishment of the Project on American Justice, or PHA. I feel like that's a prime example of your evolution. And, you know, I actually just a few minutes before joining this symposium texted Tip on the side and I said, what year did you establish the Project on uh, American Justice? And because I was pretty convinced it was before the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the huge uh, increase in public awareness over issues of policing in America and racial justice. And um, it was confirmed uh, the PHA was launched in October of 2019. And I think that was really prescient and um, bringing a diverse array of st stakeholders together to inform the charting of this visionary course forward for the field. The fact that that happened before uh, so many other entities decided to establish their own um, organizations or, or task forces of a similar nature, I think really speaks volume for the vision that CNA has. So hats off to both JRI and PHA for the important work that you're doing and that you're planning to do moving forward and which is really grounded in this symposium. So what I'd like to do today is to share a bit about my priorities for NIJ in the, the field and describe how I see those fitting into JRI's work and mission and PHA's priorities for 2023. Um, now, as I understand it, and I'm sorry I couldn't join you yesterday, that work and those priorities are embodied in the content of this symposium, and it includes uh, important topics like community relations and the role of police and prosecutors and corrections in society, um, emerging technologies and officer and organizational wellness. And those are all topics that are near and dear to my heart and double as priorities for NIJ under my leadership. But when I first got to NIJ, I knew I needed to set forth some priorities, and I didn't want to focus on topics too much because what I knew but then learned even more robustly is what a wide array of topics NIJ invests in, in terms of research and development and technology. And it spans courts and corrections and prosecutions and policing and victimization and juvenile justice issues and community-based issues and the latest data analyses and technologies to better understand patterns of crime and criminal behavior and how they shift and change over time. And importantly, what's related to those challenges and how can we better understand those causal factors and ways that they can be prevented and importantly, we have huge investments in technologies, technology standards, and a very significant body of work in the forensic and investigative sciences, which has been one of the biggest joys of my tenure at NIJ this time around. Um, and that is learning so much new around the forensic sciences that are so important for investigations, for clearing cases, for solving cold cases. There's just so much we do across so many areas. So I'm glad my instincts were right that when I got to NIJ, I didn't want to focus on topics, even though, of course, I always have my pet areas of interest, which again, tend to align pretty closely with those of uh, JRIs. Um, and so what I did instead was to focus on not the what, not the topics, but the how. How do we approach the research? How do we approach development of new knowledge and that the dissemination of that evidence? And some of you, uh, apologies in advance, have heard me speak on these priorities before, but I think they bear mentioning because they're so aligned with JRI's work and direction. And I also, I just never want to miss an opportunity to challenge the field to do more and to do better when it comes to rigorous and applied research. Um, and just to mix it up a little bit, as I walk through these priorities, and by the way, I say they're five, but they're really kind of like seven and a half, which is way too many for any director. But what can I say? I'm ambitious. Uh, what I'll do is I'll weave in uh, some of how NIJ is investing in these priorities topically, 
as well as have bay align with JRI's topical areas. And we can talk about those later. I'm sure there'll be ample time for discussion. So the first priority that I like to lead with when I address new audiences about NIJ and what's important to us is what I'm calling inclusive research. And inclusive research has a lot of different components to it, but at its most basic level, it's that the research process should not be divorced from engaging with the people that are closest to the issue or the problem that is the topic of this study. That could mean probation officers, it could mean victim service providers, it absolutely should mean people who have experienced victimization and people who have experienced the justice system. And inclusive research can happen in a lot of different ways. I always talk about it as existing on a continuum. And that continuum could have, on the very far end of it, full-on community-based participatory research where you barely even come up with the subject matter as a researcher, absent partnership with the community to ground truth whether this is a topic worthy of study. In fact, community-based participatory research invites the community to identify the problem and works with the community in equal partnership on every step of the research process. It's very important work. It's very time consuming. It builds capacity in communities. It's very important. And it really establishes credibility on both the research methodologies as well as the findings. But I wanna be clear, as much as I would love to see NIJ support more community-based participatory research, there's a wide continuum of research that is valid and important to answer pressing problems of crime and justice in our communities and in society at large. And at the far extreme, the opposite extreme from community-based participatory research are highly quantitative studies that are mostly around data analysis. And I would argue that even at that end of the continuum, there are opportunities to be inclusive. Maybe it's relying on survey data where I was trained to pilot a survey instrument, um, but where I've learned over time, the more inclusive way of doing things is to develop the survey in partnership with the people that you want to be uh, responding to the survey instrument. Um, it's also important that even if it's strictly an analysis of administrative data, there's no new data collection, that at a minimum, you bring those findings back to the people who at some point in time help generate that data. And you ground truth those findings and you get their input and their perspective on what those findings really mean. I have had many experiences when I have brought the data back to those um, important stakeholders and learned that I was going to run a risk of misinterpreting data without their input, or that it didn't consider a certain uh, way of doing the analysis without their input. It's, it's essential. So that's inclusive research. And inclusive research is essential to community relations, which I know is one of the key topical priorities for this symposium. And one way that we in the Office of Justice Programs are promoting this type of inclusive research is through our Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative. Um, it, I'm sure many of you are aware of this initiative because hundreds of thousands of dollars are being put into communities to develop community-based solutions to issues of violence and primarily gun violence. Um, now, to be clear, community-led doesn't mean the absence of law enforcement, but it does mean to honor the expertise and the insights and the perspective of community. And, and related to that, I've been obsessing over this topic of community perspectives for the better part of a decade. Um, I remember being with colleagues at the Urban Institute shortly following the death of Michael Brown in, in Ferguson, and we were sitting around a table saying, what can we do differently as researchers? What is our role? What can our impact be? And ultimately, we landed on the important question of who speaks for the community? Because what we were 
observing is that a lot of people uh, post Ferguson were speaking for community members but didn't reside there. And they might have been speaking accurately, but they might not have. And we weren't we weren't convinced that that was they were the credible messengers in that moment in time. And then that got us thinking about, well, how do we currently measure community sentiment? Well, we use surveys. What do we know about those surveys? Well, what we know is that response rate is really low and it tends to be very biased. People who um, live in safer communities, people with higher educational levels, people who have more favorable uh, interactions with and opinions of law enforcement are the ones who tend to respond to those surveys. So those metrics aren't valid. So we started toying with that at the Urban Institute and I carried these notions forward to my time here at NIJ. And, and one way that we're trying to move the field forward is that in April, we wa launched one of NIJ's signature prize challenges. The prize challenges are a different way to invite innovation in the field. Most of you are aware that NIJ does most of its research investments through the grant making process. And that's a long process. We develop solicitations to invite new research ideas. We release those solicitations. We try to give the field at least 90 days to respond, to submit applications that align with what we're requesting. We have peer review panels, they review the proposals. We are in the middle of, although thankfully the tail end of the many meetings that we have to review the results of the peer review panels and also discuss input from staff and my own input uh, to make funding decisions. And then those get awarded and that those awards take, quite frankly, months. So what's a way that we can spur innovation more quickly? It's through our prize challenges where we invite the best ideas and um, vet them and give monetary cash prizes for those that rise to the very top. So I'm really excited that in April we launched a prize challenge on inviting the best and most innovative ideas for rigorously measuring at the micro geographic level ways that we can use innovative data and sources and technologies to better represent community sentiment community experiences with law enforcement, opinions about law enforcement, experiences with crime and safety, and the justice system writ large. So we're eager to see the results of those submissions that are currently being vetted. And we're very hopeful that they serve as exemplars for the field and that they inspire piloting and inspire replication. So I hope you will stay tuned for those. We expect to announce the prize winners in November. So that's a bit about inclusive research, but uh, a close cousin to inclusive research is another priority that I've been putting forth as NIJ director. And that's this notion of conducting research through a racial equity lens, or really an equity lens writ large. There's a lot of different ways that we can and should measure equity. Um, and Equity is essential to the improvement of administration of justice, which I know is another one of JRI's focus when looking at the future of the criminal justice system. And the reason why this is important is because we all know that there are facets of the justice system in this country that were established in alignment with Jim Crow, uh, with the intent of um, institutional uh, biases. Um, some biases were not intentional, but still persist. And we also know that some of the data that we use is flawed on its face, and yet, and because it has its own baked in biases, and, and yet we use the data. We use it because it's convenient. Sometimes it's the only data we have that doesn't require original data collection. Um, I would love using the example of arrests as a measure of recidivism. I think that's really problematic. We know that arrests are a function of law enforcement activities and presence and where they patrol and who they patrol and that people who live in certain communities or who have black or brown skin are more likely to have contact 
with law enforcement that could lead to arrest. Uh, so we can and should do better across a whole host of data that we use. And that's the kind of equity lens that I'm encouraging. Another priority is to encourage collaboration within the academic community. Uh, why is that important? I, I think it's important for a lot of different reasons um, in terms of JRI and its focus and the focus of this symposium. I know that one area is looking at the role of police and prosecutors and corrections in society. And those are big priorities for NIJ as well. But in that regard, I'd like to invite you to consider the value of researching those, these domains through a multidisciplinary research lens and research team. Um, I think that throughout the academic community, we tend to be very siloed. And that also applies to the criminal justice system. It tends to be siloed. And yet there's so much we can learn from each other and from different disciplines and different components of practice in the field. Um, I often talk about what it would be like to team an economist with a social work researcher. I'd, I'd love to be a uh, fly on the wall of that, uh, that first date. <laughs> but I, I use those two extremes um, to emphasize how different approaches can lead to different solutions. Economists are bringing some really, in my mind, innovative methods. Uh, synthetic control group would be one example to create more rigorous quasi-experimental designs. But if they're not teamed up with people who have deep knowledge of the nature of the data and the policy context of how that data is generated, they could end up drawing some pretty uh, questionable solutions. Um, so I really like to see more multidisciplinary research teams and more collaboration across the different components of the justice system. Um, I think it's so important that we connect dots across system actors. Um, I professionally am a jack of all trades. Um, I think that came by necessity. I spent most of my profess professional life in the what we call the soft money world, right? Seeking grants uh, and contracts uh, to keep the shop running, right? To pursue the research that I think is important and to respond to the research priorities of the funding community. And that creates a very different focus from one of academia, which rewards going very narrow and very deep. Um, instead, in, in my professional life, I've been rewarded to really go broad and um, explore a lot of different topics. And what I think that's done is to help me connect the dots across those various domains in ways that help identify intersections, break down silos, and develop and evaluate system-wide responses. So I'd love to see more of that. I also am a big fan of promoting mixed methods. And when we undertake new research, let's be clear. There is no one best methodology that fits the bill. Now, prior NIJ directors, no names, put a premium on randomized controlled trials. And I'll be first to admit that Randomized controlled trials or experimental designs are absolutely a very rigorous approach to evaluation. But not all questions are conducive to RCTs as they're called. And um, I think it's really important to recognize that and not uh, reject certain proposals just because they don't meet that so-called gold standard. Uh, but to be clear, if you're going to propose an evaluation, you better always have a suitable comparison condition. That's something that is absolutely required. But regardless of whether the design is experimental or quasi-experimental, evaluation absent a process or sometimes it's called an implementation component is, I think, academically irresponsible. It is so frustrating to me. I've been involved in various systematic review processes to see these studies that are elevated as being highly rigorous that don't 
look at the fidelity in which the thing that they're evaluating has been implemented, it's just, it makes no sense to me. If you do that, for example, if you have a very strong randomized controlled trial and you find there's no impact, but you don't look at the fidelity in which the, say, the program is implemented, where the right people reach, did they receive the dosage as, as planned, as anticipated? Did they stay in the program or did they attrite? All of these different facets around the implementation. If you don't know that and you say something doesn't work, you don't know what you're talking about. And yet then the field grabs it and says, oh, look, this doesn't work. Um, no, we don't know whether it doesn't work or it wasn't implemented as intended. I think that's so important. And, you know, I look at the work of CNA and the huge investment that you all have made in the area of body cameras. I think that that's a great illustration of the importance of looking at implementation fidelity. Um, you know, we look at the body of research knowledge on body cameras. And I would argue that it's probably more robust than just about any other research topic in our space, which is pretty astonishing since it's a relatively new application of a technology in the field. And yet you look at the studies and it's like, yeah, it looks like they could make a difference in reducing use of force, but it seems to depend and it depends on a lot of different things. And you know, ultimately, it seems to depend on the quality of the implementation of body cameras. What policies were developed? How were they implemented? What training was involved? How were officers held accountable um, for following policy, for activating their cameras? There's so much that needs to be unpacked in order to understand what the impact of body cameras are. And I know that CNA has a long history of research and evaluation in the technology space. And I noted that merging technologies is a key focus of this symposium. And I just wanna applaud you for thinking in those terms because I know you do. And really invite the field to recognize that you should not be looking at any emerging technologies absent thinking about what it needs to take to implement them well. And that again involves policy development, policy implementation, training, accountability mechanisms, all of those are so very important. Now, my last priority also doubles as the theme of our recent NIJ National Research Conference, which we held in April of this year. It was the first such conference NIJ has hosted in over a decade. I was so proud to bring it back. And the conference theme was evidence to action. And the goal there was, is that still remaining to do more and do better as a research institute and as a field and ensuring that the evidence that we generate is not just translated so it's understandable, doesn't just reach the hands of those we're trying to reach, but actually leads them to change the way they're doing business in ways that are improved because of the evidence of what we know works. This is a tough mountain to climb. We know a lot about translating research. NIJ has done an excellent job and I've loved seeing how we've evolved over time in this regard. I made reference to this earlier, but Scott didn't mention it in my bio, but I worked at NIJ many years ago uh, it was ABD, uh, it was in 1996 through 2001, and just rejoining the Institute and seeing how it's grown and changed and improved over time has been really inspiring to me. And one key way that we've done that is through better translation, taking those journal articles and making them understandable, accessible, uh, through crime solutions, through the NIJ journal, through podcasts, through so many different mechanisms. And we also do much more now, I think, to have our ear to the ground to the needs of the field. We follow a listen, learn, and inform model. And that means we do a lot of convening of focus groups of practitioners and community members and other stakeholders to say, what are the pressing issues that you have across various domains? 
And we take that information in and then we say, okay, what do we know about current research and where are those gaps? And that directly guides our solicitation development process and the types of proposals we invite for the field. But it's that informed part that we're still wrestling with. The translation is there. We're reaching a lot of the practitioner journals. We routinely publish in Corrections Today and Police Chief Magazine in other venues, but we still don't know enough about what's called implementation science, right? What are the mechanisms that lead to practitioners and policymakers learning of evidence and implementing it and sustaining that over time? I'm so pleased that I brought on Tamara Harold, Dr. Harold. Um, is on leave of absence from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She's a superstar with a very strong track record of training in evidence-based policing practices, training practitioners, and she's leading our Evidence to Action initiative. And we are so intent on building more knowledge that's specific to this justice field and how we can do this better. I will say we, we have something to stand on, but we haven't just been like thinking about this. And NIJ has been doing a lot for a long period of time. Um, when I was at NIJ years ago, we had the locally initiated research partnerships, which establishes great collaborations between researchers and primarily law enforcement agencies uh, to work on research together. And those were, we planted a lot of seeds and some of them were sufficiently watered and sunned so that they grew and grew deep roots and those partnerships remain today. Not all of them, but many of them. But I also recognize that even those partnerships are perhaps not as equal as they need to be to push us towards that Evans to Action goal. I'm reminded of an interview I did with Lawrence Sherman for a book chapter on um, kind of how policy relevant is the field of policing and what we know, know about contributions from uh, government, from philanthropy, from research institutes in uh, creating more policy relevance that is guided by the research evidence. And uh, those of you who know Larry Sherman know he is a colorful orator and he's great with imagery. And he shared with me this wonderful analogy um, because those, these research partnerships, and this has been my experience as well, are often the researcher coming and knocking on the door. And Larry says it's akin to saying, hi, can we cook in your kitchen? We'll bring most of the tools, but if you can give us a few of the ingredients, you know, we'll, 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 we'll cook something up. And then you do the evaluation. You get the data, right? And sometimes in, you know, enough of the buy-in and some access to the, the subject matter experts. And then you, you cook the concoction. And then you come back and say, take it, eat it, try it. It's good. Isn't it good? Don't you like it? Do we make more of it? Would you like to make more yourself? I mean, it's just a very um, unequal partnership. And I've experienced it. I know many of you have. I have some former colleagues where um, even the leadership who invites us in to do this work, to do this evaluation, has been gone and we come back and like, here's the findings, what do you think? And they're like, um, yeah, we'll get on the calendar and have a 20 minute briefing. It's just, it's not enough. So I think one of the ways we can change this is to make that establishment of the research partnership more equal. So instead of the researcher coming in and say, I have a research question, can we, I use you as a laboratory to answer that question? Um, we work in partnership so that the questions percolate up from the agency itself. And that's why I'm so excited about NIJ's LEADS Scholars Program. I hope many of you have heard about LEADS. It stands for Law Enforcement Advancing Data and Science. Um, we just announced our newest cohort. Uh, we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the LEADS Scholars Program. It was established in 2014. And members of the earliest cohorts are now law enforcement executives. I think it's that kind of investment in people inside agencies. And to be clear, LEAD Scholars has an, an, a sworn officer component, has a civilian component, 
and it has a smaller and newer academic partnership component. So, and, and people in any of those three categories can apply to become a lead scholar, be a part of a cohort, attend uh, trainings together, share information, um, you know, be a support group, a learn from experts in the field. Um, I think that's the way that we're going to secure that equal partnership that we really seek to promote the evidence to action. Um, I think that one example of that partnership, and I will wrap up soon, um, is the topic of law enforcement wellness and organizational change. Both topics, actually, there are two, but I view them as very um, intertwined. And I know that those two are key priorities for JRI and CAJ. And um, I think those two topics, officer wellness and organizational change, change are so closely aligned because of what we know about the type of trauma that officers uh, experience. It's, it's often vicarious, but sometimes it's actual first person trauma and how uh, the culture in most agencies, um, I'm talking about not just law enforcement, but corrections, is one that uh, frowns upon and stigmatizes help seeking and you know, we talk a lot about training police and crisis intervention training, um, identifying people in stress, identifying people who are experiencing trauma or in crisis without an acknowledgement that officers also have experienced their own trauma. And more often than not, that trauma is not addressed. That's why wellness is so, is so important, but it's also why organizational change is important because until you change the organization, that culture, for example, to invite help seeking to lift it up as the way that officers should be thinking about their personal wellness and how they approach their professional and personal lives, um, you're not going to see improvements in either. Um, so I think that those are really important areas where they could be lifted up by more equal partnerships with agencies. So with our lead scholars, for example, a lot of them are exploring questions around officer wellness, as well as around issues of recruitment and retention, which is another issue that's very reliant on aspects of organizational culture. I'm pleased to share that NIJ is currently reviewing submissions to a solicitation that was new that we released this year and uh, that was uh, specific to the topic of culture and climate in correction settings, one that's all important um, for the wellness of people who work in correctional facilities and the people who are confined there. In closing, I just want to invite you all to do what you've been doing so well all along. Be collaborative, establish those authentic partnerships, and those equal partnerships. Continue to seek out the nuance and the context in the research you're engaging in and find better ways to measure it. Um, brown truth your findings and always, always honor the expertise of everyone involved. And importantly, please maintain your focus on that North Star in pursuit of a more equitable and effective system of justice. All of these areas are vital, and I'm so heartened that JRI, like so many others in the field, is increasingly embracing them in all the partnerships they forge, in all the work that they're doing, and in the manner in which they share findings with the field. Thank you. Oh, Scott, I think you're muted. Thank you very much. Uh a lot to think about, a lot to go back to the uh, study, Carol, and and work on for, for the future and think both uh, I, as individuals doing research, as individuals who are part of a team engaged in research and as part of an organization thinking more broadly about what the future holds for this organization and what the future should be uh, for uh, this organization. I've received a couple of calls, uh, uh, questions rather, from uh, folks uh, who's listening in on the talk, 
and I, I thought I, I would relate a couple of them. Uh, the implementation issue, and, and it's one that a number of us have been after for, for quite some time. Uh, Ron Huff uh, used to stand up at the uh, NIJ Research and Evaluation Conference, and he would hold a blank piece of paper and say that uh, he's that paper had every uh, uh, program that worked on the list and people would say, but it's a blank piece of paper. And he'd say, the key finding is you can't find the program. And so, but that, that belies this sort of come in at the end, let's get some data after the program's over. And unless the researcher uh, is, is along from the beginning, uh, to learn from the programmatic staff, but also to encourage them. And, and I think the Colorado Blueprints provide a good, a good example of this as well, though they, they can be, I think for my cup of coffee, a, a little too rigid uh, from time to time. Where, where would you point beyond NIJ reports, uh, beyond corrections today, beyond police chief, uh, to get these uh, implementation embeddedness studies a broader audience? Well, let me start by saying we don't have the studies we need. And one of my goals in the coming fiscal year is to invite more implementation science studies. I mentioned Dr. Tamara Harold. She has spent months now researching implementation science in terms of what we know across every discipline imaginable. Um, there's much more in medicine and public health. There's next to nothing in justice. Um, and she's looked at them all and she's identified some absurd number of different models of the best way to get from evidence to implementation and next to no evaluations of what model works best. Um, so I hate to say this, but there are a lot of researchers, so maybe you'll be understanding when I say we need more research, but we really do need more research in this space. That said, you very kindly did not reference crimesolutions.gov, which I think is another, uh, let's call it a resource in the field that I think many have a love-hate relationship with. <laughs> Um, you can go into Crime Solutions and you can extract out really important information. There's some question about how Crime Solutions does its ratings, how it draws its conclusions, and importantly, how accessible those conclusions are to the people we really want to serve. I think Crime Solutions is a great resource for graduate students writing literature reviews. I'm not convinced that it's reaching the practitioners and policymakers we want to reach. And that is why this year we will be investing heavily in a soup to nuts review of everything to do with crime solutions um, with an eye towards making it more impactful. I mean, it's like a gold mine that's like hidden behind, I don't know, my imagery is off, but like some like big cliff where <laughs> you can't figure out where the opening is. Um, so there's a lot that, that's in there already that we know, but getting that information out to the field is going to be really important. And then I would also reference um, what we know from the literature, because there is some, and um, that is that credible messengers make a big difference. Um, and that means that uh, the people we're trying to reach from the field are much more likely to have their ears open to believe and implement evidence when they hear it from other people like them, usually the thought leaders. So reaching the thought leaders is a very important strategy for us. And another strategy that Tamara has lifted up through her own research and frankly, just by the way she um, does her own training and presentations, and that's through storytelling. And when I think about how we can better reach the field I often talk about the power of numbers plus narrative. I feel that criminology, I think we suffer from an inferiority complex. I mean, you think about the hierarchy of the social science disciplines, like economists are somewhere on the top and 
you know, sociologists are kind of somewhere on the bottom and then criminologists are below sociologists. And like, so you know, we try to be like more rigorous, you know, more quantitative. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, except for when we um, neglect the qualitative in favor of the quantitative. And so I think with the qualitative, that helps us tell the story. Um, and the storytelling is what really reaches new audiences. Uh, I just met with our senior leadership team yesterday, and I'm challenging each of the five science offices to create a story that involves both numbers and narratives around a new topic each month so that we have a better way of describing what we know in ways that can reach the field. Are, are you able to stick around five extra minutes at the top of the hour? Sure. We've got- I'm sorry I took so long on my part. No, no, no you, that, I never know how idea. long I'm We're, gonna speak. And <laughs> um, our, uh, our colleague, Brenda Bond, has asked a question about um, the need to study uh, organizational structure, culture, and particularly implementation as cultures change in 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 a variety of ways and i guess body worn cameras would be a good immediate example of how policing has changed culturally and the like uh, will support for those studies of implementation and adaptation and culture be supported by nij i know the the culture and is a good i think a great step in the right direction will there be more to come a lot depends on my budget for FY24. If you're a follower of congressional appropriations, you may have observed that the House gutted our budget request. It was quite demoralizing. The Senate has maintained our budget uh, for FY24 at the same level as last year. I can work with the same level. I'm gonna make some hard decisions in this coming year. I mean, I'm a political appointee. I don't know how long I'm gonna be in this position. This could be my last, all right, I'll try not to get teary-eyed, full solicitation season. Who knows, right? Sure. And I wanna make the most of it. So I'm gonna be making some pretty tough decisions about what I invest in in the future. But um, suffice it to say, community-based research partnerships, courts and prosecution and community organizations, that is going to be a priority for me moving forward. Um, inviting proposals on implementation science is something I'm, I dearly hope I can carve out resources for. Whether I can bring back the uh, corrections, culture and climate solicitation remains to be seen. Um, but I would argue, I think Brenda is kind of stating this in her question, um, that looking at implementation science also requires looking at organizational culture and that the two go hand in hand. Well, we appreciate you fighting the good fight. Um, I uh, had the pleasure of having an office next to Nancy Rodriguez during before and then after her time at NIJ. And, I think that was her greatest frustration uh, that, of course, dealing with the congressional budgets, but but also that the time in the end was so short uh, to make a difference and to get a change. Um, but but it appears that uh, BJA has got good leadership. Um, BJS has a real strong internal person now. Um, and, and so I, I'm always an optimist or I'd a, been selling pretzels for the last 45 yeah, years. Yeah, you and me both. I was just talking to uh, Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon about like some such governmental bureaucratic frustration or another. And, um, and it actually mirrored a conversation I had with Lori Robinson uh, a week earlier where we, we were both saying like, you got to be an optimist to be in this job <laughs> or you won't survive it. <laughs> Um, let me check and see. We're nearing the end and we want to be um, careful with your time because we know it, it's the commodity you can't reproduce. But I, I do want to take the opportunity on behalf of, of all the staff and, uh, 
and the folks from non-CNA JRI locations who've joined us to hear you talk. Some of us have heard some of this before, but it's always good to hear it. And I think uh, when one is pushing, as you remember, pushing proposals out late at night and early in the morning and hashing things out with, with colleagues, it's good to know that there's someone at the top of an organization like NIJ that's pushing forward uh, and creating opportunities for us to do as researchers and policy and implementation people, uh, what we all wanna do and, and that's make things better. On, on that note, I will say thank you. Um, and I'll turn it back to uh, Chip and Vivian. Um, keep fighting the good fight. We appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Scott. And thank you, Chip and Vivian, and thanks to all. Thank you so much, Director Levine. We just truly appreciate uh, your dedication, the priorities that you've outlined, like you mentioned at the beginning, they align so well with what uh, CNA and our center is also trying to achieve. So uh, we will also continue the good fight um, uh, in these areas. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we are going to break for um, about 10, 15 minutes, uh, reconvene at 1.15 for our next session on community relations. But thank you again. <laughs>